despite me being one of the great minds in the MMA community, I have gotten a few picks wrong. And as I said, we know that I've gotten most of them right. But we are going to go over the select few. All right, there's a lot. There's a lot of them that I've gotten terribly wrong. And we're going to look at what I was thinking before I made these picks and then what actually happened, which, you know, usually was a disaster. And at the end of the video, I'm also going to show you guys a couple of fights that I've gotten wrong technically, but I also got them right. And some of you guys may say that I'm just coping in that part of the video, but let's just get into it, man. Without further ado, let's start this off. All right, we may as well just get the worst one out of the way. I picked Cyril Gaon to 50-45 John Jones and to school him and put on a masterclass on the feet. I think Cyril Gaon's going to get in his face and show him what bonga means all about. Cerebral Surreal is going to be the man to expose the overrated wrestling of John Jones. You're right, that 26% takedown accuracy in his last four fights, it ain't fooling me, and I'm not picking the old man John Jones. The only thing he has to worry about is the threat of the takedown. And if he can go in there and get in the face of Francis Ngannou, and get in the face of Derek Lewis, and get in the face of Tai Tuivasa, imagine how confident he's going to be if he's standing across from Pillow Hands Jones. He's going to shuck John off of him every time Jones tries to close the distance, and he's going to put that jab on his nose all night. These are the things that I had predicted. I said that Gon was going to go out there and smoke John Jones, show levels, and look like a LeBron James in his prime, facing a Wizards version of Michael Jordan. And what actually happened, instead of Gon looking like LeBron James and Jones looking like the Wizards version of Michael Jordan, is Jones submitted him in three minutes. I mean, I was actually thinking Gon was like the new LeBron James of MMA, that he was that talented, that he had that much potential, and that if he could come this far with just striking, imagine what he could do if he set his mind to stuffing a couple of takedowns in training camp. Now, I shouldn't have doubted the talent of John Jones because he's literally the GOAT. I was thinking like, bro, his way to win is by getting a takedown. And when I was watching his fights in the lead up to this, John Jones was getting a lot of his takedown stuffed in the early goings. And when he actually had success with the grappling, it was after he had had a bunch of investment shots on the feet where he had already broken his opponent's legs down a little bit, their body down with kicks. And once they started to tire out, then Jones's takedown started to actually, you know, land at a higher clip. And I was thinking the only way Jones wins is if he makes it a snooze fest, if he makes it boring, and he's going to have to clinch gone up against the fence and knee him to the thigh and stomp on his feet. And it was the direct opposite because he got the takedown on his first try and he slipped the first punch that Gon actually committed to. And to be fair, I was hyped when Gon landed an oblique kick because I was saying in the lead up to this, anything that Jones does, Gon can do better. He's basically as fast as a middleweight, so there's no difference in speed this time. And if, you know, Jones lands a spinning back kick, Gon's going to do one that's even better, more fancy with more finesse, and he's going to land it harder because he's a heavyweight. Jones lands the kicks to the knees. Gon can do that too. But it didn't mean shit because I was doubting the skill discrepancy between the heavyweight division and the light heavyweight division when it comes to the grappling. And we didn't have an instance of there being a guy like uh, Jilton Almeida just run through every heavyweight and not get hit at all and be able to take a guy like Jarzino Rosenstrike down and submit him within the first exchange. Whereas a guy like Curtis Blades, who is always been in the heavyweight division who's touted as the best grappler in the division or was looked at as the best heavyweight grappler barely scraped by to a decision with his grappling over Jarzino Rosenstrike. So I was thinking, man, these heavyweights are harder to take down. They have all the size. John Jones is old. He basically just lost to Dominic Reyes, but I should have picked him because he's literally the goat, the most talented guy that there ever was. And also had his wrestling shoes on in preparation for Francis Ngannou for multiple years. I mean, Jones was getting ready for a much bigger guy to take down a guy that's probably way harder to take down with Francis Ngannou's improved takedown defense. I should have known he would make easy work of Gon, but I just expected Gon to be better. You know what I mean? But terrible prediction overall. Horrible prediction. I'll never pick against John Jones again. Pyotr Jan versus Marab de Velashvili. All right. I said that Marab can't hold people down for the life of him. And because of that, there is no way he's going to be able to beat Pyotr Jan. Pyotr Jan is amazing takedown defense. And if you can't hold him down and you're not dangerous on the feet, how the fuck are you going to beat him? 
Marab Devalashvili has been more successful than any other bantamweight in UFC history at taking people down with a record of 63 takedowns. Given that, I'm still going to pick Pyotr Jan to beat Marab, partially due to that statistic right there, and it's in the stat. Why are you taking people down so often and not keeping them there and being able to hold them there? And Pyotr Jan's also a guy that has amazing cardio that walks people down. And it's like, bro, this guy's a slow starter. Marab's a fast starter. Marab's going to gas himself out, have no success, have no finishing ability. And by the third, fourth, and fifth, those are Pyotr's strongest rounds. He's going to win easily there. Marab Devalashvili is a poor man's Aljamain Sterling is what I was saying. He's not good enough. And he showed the best cardio in UFC history and 50 45 Jan with ease and broke him before the third round. There's Jan looking like he had just seen a ghost. And Marab Devalashvili put on one of the most impressive feats of endurance that I've ever seen in my entire life. I didn't expect it, but I should have known. Or, I mean, to be honest, sometimes it's just impossible to know these things because we hadn't seen Marab in a five rounder. But I should have known that if Piotr's a slow starter, that there's a chance that a fast starter that never gets tired might just not give Piotr Jan a chance to build. He was just giving him too much information. Like he was fighting like an explosive fast twitch fighter for 25 minutes, spamming takedowns, spamming feints, spamming combinations on the feet, never letting you settle. And Piotr Jan is a slow starter, just was never able to get anything going. Uh, so this was a bad pick for me. You know, I was thinking that Marab Devalashvili, he's not Aljamain Sterling. He has no ability to submit you. Well, if Piotr Jan gets taken down, he'll be at no threat whatsoever. And on the feet, Marab's not dangerous either. And he also can't strike at a distance. He has to get in the pocket with Piotr Jan. You don't want to stand in the pocket with Piotr Jan, especially when he has really good takedown defense. He's just going to let his hands go and light you up. And that never happened. Piotr Jan never let his hands go because he couldn't. He just wasn't able to get going. He was put into a reaction fight, and he never escaped. Islam Makhachev and Charles Oliveira won. Okay, so we know that he's not Habib, all right? And he just fought Bobby Green, okay? Who had a fight just the other week. Are we gonna pretend he didn't have a fight the other week? And then he fought Dan Hooker. <laughs> Who's got the wrestling of a fucking bugger? All right, so if no one's gonna say it, I can't. Islam, you fought a bunch of fucking gang. You're struggling with Tiago Moises. <laughs> You can't struggle with Drew Dober and Tiago Moises and then just go in there and whoop Charles Oliveira, the most dangerous submission threat that MMA has ever seen. My prediction was that Islam had no chance because the striking wasn't shit in my mind in the lead up to this fight. And there's my thumbnail saying that Islam's overrated. He's not Habib. He's been knocked out before. Charles Oliveira is the most dangerous grappler in MMA history. And if it goes to the ground, there is nothing that Islam Makhachev can do to have any success. And that means that if it's on the feet, Charles Oliveira wins every time. And I was very confident because I hadn't seen anything impressive from Islam Makhachev that Charles was just going to knock him out. And I knew Islam was defensively sound, but I didn't know he would dominate Charles on the feet and submit him within two rounds, which is actually what happened. Uh, Islam did a really good job of hiding his striking in the buildup to this fight. We didn't see it against Dan Hooker. We didn't see any of it against Bobby Green. The only thing we saw was a high kick and a left hand and a knee in the clinch every now and then. But he was a grappler that really only threw strikes to set up his takedowns or to close the distance to get a hold of someone. He was not striking to hurt people on the feet. And his coaches were saying, man, this guy is unreal on the feet too. And I just didn't buy into it. Based on the tape that I was watching, Charles had just finished Gagey, had just sent Gagey flying across the octagon. He had basically walked Dustin Poirier down and started to break him in the clinch ripping to the body with violent knees. And I was thinking to myself, like, Charles's chin is granted. He can go through a war with Gagey and Poirier. And yes, he's getting dropped, but like, how hurt is he really? Islam's not going to be able to hurt him like Poirier can. And he was. So Islam proved me wrong. And a lot of people after the Benil Dariush fight, in which just happened, Charles beating Benil Dariush, were saying that how could we have picked Benil? He wasn't able to prove anything other than beating Mateusz Gamrot. Mateusz Gamrot's not that elite. Well, Islam Makhachev, before fighting Charles Oliveira, didn't really have any elite wins, and he did prove us wrong. So you never know. Sometimes these guys outside of the top five that have no top five wins get it done and can show massive improvements and can actually be better than the people at the top of the division. And that was Islam Makhachev on that night. So uh, I think the rematch is going to look different, though. 
Glover Teixeira and Jamal Hill. That's right. I picked Glover Teixeira to school Jamal Hill on the ground. I thought he was going to cut through him like butter. And to be fair, Jamal Hill in his previous fight before fighting Glover got taken down by Tiago Santos, who was an old man. This was post Jones, Tiago Santos with no knees. And Santos took him down, a striker. And I was thinking to myself, if Tiago Santos can take him down, imagine the world of pain he's going to be in when Glover Teixeira gets in there. There is no way he'll be able to survive that onslaught. And of course, Jamal Hill beat Glover to a pulp for five rounds and put on one of the best performances I've ever seen, as you see in the thumbnail, smoked him. And I was thinking that his way to win was to knock Glover out early because as the fight progresses, that's Glover territory. You know what I mean? That's where Glover Teixeira thrives. He builds as the fights go on. And once he gets a hold of you and he puts a little bit of a beating on you, you're a shell of who you were when the fight started. And I was thinking, if Glover gets his hands on this guy, he's screwed. He's going to gas out and Glover's just going to be too much. And Jamal Hill showed some insane cardio, five-round pace, and had the ability to scramble out of the bad positions because Glover Teixeira got his best position that he could have possibly got, which was the mount. And Jamal Hill just bucked him off. Whereas he got taken down by Tiago Santos. But against Glover Teixeira, he just bucks him off and, you know, scrambles out of there like it's nothing. The fight could have been stopped. It was that bad of a beating too. Like Jamal Hill literally put a bad beating on Glover to the point to where I thought the referee should have stepped in. So another bad performance from me as an analyst, but an amazing performance from Jamal Hill shutting the doubters up. There's the thumbnail of Volkanovski getting squashed like a bug by Islam Makhachev. That was my prediction. Islam's going to finish him. There's no way that Volkanovski's going to be able to close the skill gap when it comes to the grappling. Volk started training in his mid-20s, and I knew he was so talented. I was like, bro, I understand that he's been able to do all these great things on the feet, but look at the grapplers that he's fought. There hasn't been anyone like Islam Makhachev. The best grappler he's fought is Brian Ortega that has no wrestling, and he almost submitted him. And Islam's been grappling since he was a kid. You just can't close the gap. It's too late. And he's also at a size discrepancy. But what actually happened is that Volkanovsky did so well that the whole world called it a robbery. And I was complaining afterwards, saying that Volk won 3-2 and basically embarrassed Islam Akashev. Just completely proved me wrong because he shut down the grappling of Islam. I was dumbfounded at how Volkanovsky made it so that Islam couldn't do any damage to him on the ground whatsoever. In fact, the biggest moment on the ground throughout the whole fight was the last minute where Volkanovsky dropped Islam, got on top of him, and beat him to a pulp with ground and pound, going to the body, going to the head with massive shots. And yes, Islam Makhachev looked good on the feet, but I knew he was going to be solid there too because of what he did to Charles Oliveira in the fight before. Islam Makhachev going into this was one of the hardest men to hit in the UFC. In fact, he was statistically the hardest guy to hit. And Volkanovsky landed more on Islam than Islam's last five opponents combined. So, uh, yeah, he basically shut up all the doubters and made it extremely close. And although I still think that Islam did enough to win, you can make the argument that Volk won as well. So either man could have gotten their hand raised and it wouldn't have been an issue. But I was wrong because Volk shut down the grappling. And I was saying that, dude, training with Craig Jones isn't going to be this massive factor in the fight like you can train with Craig Jones for a couple years it's different when you're in there with Islam and it actually did pay off big time Craig Jones was able to teach Volkanovsky pretty well and uh, Volk was never in trouble on the ground so that was a bad pick for me I thought he was going to get squashed and if Islam was going to get a hold of him he would submit him with ease or just beat the shit out of him okay and now we're going to discuss the predictions that I got wrong but I also got right this is the truth bro I said that Adesanya could finish Alex Pereira by KO, and it has to be within the first two rounds. And that Alex Pereira, if it goes into the distance, if it goes into the third, fourth, and fifth, is just going to have his way with Adesanya because he's a better kickboxer. I actually think that he needs to kind of bait him into the fence, if anything. He needs to make Pereira think that he's backing him down. And I know that's a really dangerous place for Adesanya to be, but here's the thing. I believe that Adesanya's speed with that right hand is good enough to catch Pereira off guard in the first two rounds. And I believe that, again, he has this offbeat style of striking that only the guys at the top have. And he can use that to rock Alex Pereira. I think that Adesanya can finish Alex Pereira. I think he's capable of doing that. Not only because he's just capable of finishing anyone if he has the right moment. I Like, a lot of people were saying Pereira's the guy with the power in his hands, and he's reliant upon that. When in reality, 
it was kind of Izzy, you know what I mean, that was needing that KO. Because I said it in the lead up to this fight. If it goes past the second round, Adesanya resorts to cruise mode where he's just kind of pit-patting around for points like a tennis player. And Alex Pereira is the guy that's a better kicker. He's better at throwing investment shots to the body and he's better in the clinch. And it actually takes him a long time to set up that left hand. So I think that if it goes into the distance, I favor Alex Pereira every single time against another striker like an Israel Adesanya. Adesanya has never gotten a finish outside of the second round in his entire UFC career. And he kind of did need that KO because look at the condition that he was in before the KO. His legs were screwed. He was hurt. And of course, Alex Pereira's IQ was worse than I expected because he rushed the finish. And he basically got himself into the same trap that he was falling into in the first fight that Adesanya used to rock him. And what actually happened was that Adesanya did finish him. Like I said, he finished him up against the fence within two rounds by a brutal KO. But to be fair... Uh, me saying that Israel Adesanya was at a skill disadvantage didn't necessarily hold up all the way because he was skilled enough to bait Alex Pereira into getting KO'd. So that in and of itself shows that you're the superior skilled guy on the night. Um, but still, it basically played out how I thought it was going to go down. Like, of course, I picked Alex Pereira, but I knew that this was possible and I was pissed to actually see it happen because I'm not a big Izzy fan. But it is what it is, man. Gilbert Burns and Bilal Muhammad. I said it would be an easy fight for Gilbert Burns. On the ground, anything Bilal does is going to be nullified. And on the feet, he's just outskilled. He's outgunned. So Burns is just going to run through him and bulldoze him in the first two rounds and knock him out. And I said the only way in which Bilal Muhammad can win is if he slips on a banana peel. And what actually happened is that he slipped on a banana peel. All right? I understand Bilal Muhammad basically 50-45 Gilbert Burns, but that was the worst version of Gilbert Burns that we've ever seen. It was a overtrained, slow, lethargic Gilbert, even before the four massive injuries that occurred in the first round. So you have a guy that looks terrible, that isn't fast at all, that then has four major injuries in the first round. That's slipping on a banana peel if there ever was one. Uh, and to be fair, I could have seen the overtraining definitely being an issue for Burns, but I saw it as He's got pep in his step. He's got the activity. He's got momentum. So that actually was not great on my end because I was saying to myself, he has momentum, he has confidence, and he's just going to blow by Bilal Muhammad that's been on the couch. But it was the other way around. So to be fair, I should have maybe looked at that as not necessarily a good thing for Gilbert Burns because he looked terrible even before he got injured. He looked slow as fuck. I said that the first right hand Gilbert Burns is going to throw is going to show you guys all you need to know. He's going to show a massive speed advantage, and the opposite happened. I was disappointed with the first right hand that Gilbert Burns threw before the injury. But I want to know in the comments, what are some of your worst picks to date or some of your best picks to date? Let me know. Until next time.